ट्रांसपोर्टेशन यस वॉट इज ट्रांसपोर्टेशन इकोनॉमिक वैल्यू ऑफ रिवर्स रिवर्स ओके सॉरी रिक्रिएशन या यू कैन मेक अ लॉट ऑफ मनी विथ टूरिज्म एंड बाय सेलिंग हाउस इज रिवर व्यू अपार्टमेंट रिवर व्यू अपार्टमेंट ऑन वन ऑफ द जीवित परिसर आहे then probably they came to i rent out or whatever <laughs> <laughs> it's already sold by that time it's already sold yes. uh, yeah so hydroelectric <coughs> is another very important economic value of river and uh, uh, so when the british left india 75 years ago they left india not because of the quit india movement or anything else but because there was nothing left in india to take mm. they got bored चूस लिया था उस तब तक ऐसे हाँ चूस लिया था हमको इंडिया ऑलरेडी वॉज इन वेरी बैड शेप इन टर्म्स ऑफ पोलिटिकल टर्म ऑयल कास्ट रिलीजन ऑल ऑफ दैट एंड दिस एंड ओके नाउ वी आर नॉट टू मैनेज यू यू गो बैक टेक इट दैट दे हैड ऑलरेडी गिवन अस सम ऑफ आर बिगेस्ट फैमिली राइट यू वुड रिमेंबर द बंगाल फैमिली which killed literally millions 9 8 or 9 million people that famine was uh, a result of several factors not just for lack of production but there was a huge pest attack in west bengal uh, the japanese had bombed uh, rangoon and you know there was uh, a mass migration from rangoon into kolkata the population suddenly increased of bengal and uh, the japanese attack kind of uh, uh, the 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 traders of kolkata feared the the japanese attack and many of them left and the godowns were uh, were locked and food was not available so on and so forth but uh, to cut the long story short you know millions of people died died in that famine it was not a problem of production but it was a problem of management and misgovernance and uh, lack of uh, empathy towards the local people by the british uh, but successively we had more famine we had the bihar famine after that we had another famine in madhya pradesh all of this uh, left uh, india and especially nehru thinking that uh, we must first invest in our agriculture and to invest in the agrarian system <coughs> to, uh, the only thing that british had taught us was to build dams why am i saying the british had taught us because before the british we had an extremely impressive and sustainable way of managing fresh water mm. there were traditional water harvesting systems very very unique to agro climatic and bio geography what tamil nadu did bihar did completely different what the kutch did the rest of the gujarat did differently what they used in impal and manipur was different from what they used in uh, uh, ladakh right so all of these regional differences were extremely unique in terms of their water storage capacity water harvesting capacity water use and water uh, Uh, improvement, so to say, you know, community management of water resources. But all of that was thrown to the wind when the British landed in India, and the British said, "To control the local people, we have to control water." And they changed the uh, extremely decentralized way of water governance into a highly centralized way of water governance. They kept all the decisions with themselves, and they were able to control it well themselves. I think with the zamindar, and they had the mahalwari, the rayatwari system. the zamindari system all these systems were essentially controlling water as a resource so that taxes could be collected there and people could be managed and when this happened we lost our identity with traditional water harvesting system we lost the the knowledge which was handed over by word of mouth 
there were no documented systems, mm -hmm. so people were unable to do so. The Ahar Pine of Bengal, uh, Bihar still exists, the Zabo still exists in Northeast Asia, or the, uh, the uh, airy system of uh, Tamil Nadu still exists, <laughs> but nobody manages because we have created large structures which Nehru very famously called as the temples of modern India, which were the dams. <laughs> the first five-year plan made significant investments in dams. So the Bhakran Angal Dam was the first. The Damodar Valley project was another project to come up. And we successively brought all our rivers into a complete economic constraint. Now the rivers were no longer free-flowing rivers. They were owned by the government of India. Exactly like the British wanted us to have it. Huh? Big person has got a question. Yes. They say that the dams prevent floods, but when they open the gate, it causes even more bigger floods. Where did you read that uh, dams prevent floods? In the school university. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry I asked that question. <laughs> no, it is fine. No, but it is fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, dams prevent flood was a narrative which was used for a very long time by hydrologists but they they are all agreed now that dams cannot prevent it right? so mm -hmm. that's gone that textbook has to be put into the raddi you take 5 rupees per kilo for the textbook mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we have to still write the same in the exam so we have to tell him that <laughs> we have arguments because he, he denies a lot of things in this book yeah. uh, yes he cannot tell the reality in exams yeah. true <laughs> that <laughs> that is <laughs> so uh, yeah at, and uh, you know, the centralized way of management <coughs> was picked up by Nehru from uh, Russia, Nikita Khrushchev and you know, his central planning. We kind of admired that. Uh, we threw to wind what uh, Gandhi was saying, what uh, Madhav Govind Ranade had said much before Gandhi, what Gopal Krishna Gopre had said, what uh, so many other uh, intellectuals had advised Nehru against that and he went ahead and you know, went on with that system of uh, investing in agriculture and creating large dams. The large dams, and we have a huge network, we have a labyrinth of dams in the Himalayan river, which have completely shut down <laughs> all the alluvial matter coming into Sundarbans. Oh. So the ecological productivity of Sundarbans has been diminishing every day since the first dam was created on that, in that particular riverine system. And so much so that the Sundarbans is now unable to support the apex predator there, which is the tiger and the aquatic apex predator, which was the crocodile. If you can, if a, if a landscape cannot support the apex predator, then it, it's a very clear indicator that the food chain down below has broken. And the food chain down below has broken because the ecological productivity of that landscape has diminished. So that landscape is unable to host the, the smallest of the uh, organisms, which are the phytoplankton, the zooplankton, <coughs> they, the, the, the feeders who are feeding on that, then the, those, the primary carnivores who are feeding on that, and the secondary carnivores, and so on and so forth. So when the food chain below that is broken, then the apex predator cannot survive. And when the apex predator cannot survive, then humans rush in for Schools rush in where angels fear to tread. That's exactly what happens with you. And I always say, the most invasive species on the planet is not water hyacinth and subabul and lantern it is homo sapiens. <coughs> we, we, we rush into areas where there is no apex predator. We go in where the food chain is broken and then we cultivate agriculture and we use up all the groundwater and the surface water. We spoil it. Sorry? We spoil it. Yeah, and we spoil everything. Spoil, spoil it for ourselves. And this, this started happening, Sundarban started degrading all the estuaries, all the mangrove forests. We started taking away the mangrove forests. Oh, by the way, if you want to write what actually stops flood, you should write the answer as mangrove forests, not dams. Yeah. <laughs> mm. And mangroves are actually uh, um, yeah, ecological and landscape. Trees? Huh? Coconut trees? <laughs> not really. Well, trees in general, in general yes, trees. but not specifically in coconut trees. trees. Many other things can actually do that. Yeah, so we invested and, and the logic behind creating all these labyrinths of dams in the Himalayas was that it will yield hydroelectricity. And we looked at hydroelectricity as green energy. 
and we we always love green energy right the entire las vegas thankfully is powered by hoover dam which gets gets hydroelectricity otherwise las vegas is, is guzzles electricity mm. like a one small country you know there's so much uh, uh, but but today we know that hydroelectricity is no longer green energy it's not at all green energy. it has uh, killed rivers it has displaced tribals it has taken them to places where they don't know what to do with that landscape they are not used to that landscape they are they are pushed into poverty they are pushed into chronic poverty and this is not what is today known as just transition just as in justice justice we have to move from a fossil fuel <coughs> economy to a renewable energy economy but we have to do so in a very just and fair manner if we use hydroelectricity it's not just because it has displaced animals tribal it has submerged forest it has killed the landscape it has taken away the area from the flora and the fauna and diverted towards human use so you can hardly call that as just one so uh, hydroelectricity uh, was a huge economic resource for that fishing you know in india we had literally hundreds of fishing communities which existed only on freshwater fish in west bengal you still have that you go to the chicken snack you know what is a chicken snack chicken snack ha huh? chicken snack is that smallest part of india which is the most vulnerable mm, what is that uh, where is it west bengal and sikkim yeah 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 which mm. connects mainland of india with the northeastern states you have to pass through a very small region which is at the top of it is darjeeling and at the bottom you have to pass through that so very narrow stretch is just about a few hundred not even a hundred kilometers less than that that's the chicken snack chicken snack there you will see communities which still thrive on uh, fresh water fishing mm. Mm. right mm. which is the most charismatic river which is there which flows through that tista 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 is a yes. beautiful river it originates Easter. at a height of almost 1700 it's it's one of the <coughs> it's a river which originates at a, one of the highest points latching or latching that is probably yeah uh, in one glacier and then it melts and comes down as soon as it hits the ground the tista is a very small river if you if you are traveling in himalaya then if you are coming down darjeeling it's a very small river but as soon as it hits the plateau it it's breaks into a million breaks it's a beautiful large river right and it is stopped only by the one single barrage the gajal doba barrage which is also a wetland but the gajal doba barrage has stopped the entire uh, sediment flow and the organic flow which enters that but al- b- along with the tista you have many other here you have the torsha you have the kaljani you have the jaldhaka you have the murti very small rivers very beautiful rivers and they are the lifelines of that chicken neck area and they uh, there are so many endemic and very tasty fish yeah because th- there would be some fish lovers here which are not marine fish but they are fresh water fish trout. sorry trout. Trout. trout yeah the trout and the, you know uh, so many species of the trout exist there the hilish the ilish the hilsa which is there that also mm. come from the torsha and the tista and that region and uh, that's a huge economic value because you know hilsa earns a lot of money for the farmers there as well as the trout but we do no longer have the trout but now we have the breeding uh, uh, nurseries for that now because of the gajal doba barrage look what has happened downstream when you create one dam mm-hmm. the communities downstream are unable to get their fish because they cannot go back to the source region to breed you know you have mm-hmm. large mm-hmm. dams they cannot cross those barrages and because they don't have that then they have created a, a system of pukurs if you if you been to kolkata there are pukurs there right? pukurs pukur is a pond or a dam hmm. uh, sorry pond or a lake they have created pukurs where they do breed fish breeding so in tista you have many pukurs and jalda so fish so harvesting uh, they do there they do there in pukurs yeah in the pukurs uh, and diggies they call it in some part they call it diggies but in mm-hmm. kolkata there are pukurs so these you know, are upper uh, pukur area is used to be a large lake garden reaches was all once upon a time uh, brackish water wetlands you, know, you have uh, so these are local names you mean they so? are the local bengali west bengali, bengali names which come up there pukurs diggies um yeah so they were yielding a lot of economic value there what else do you think would be the economic value of the river farming also yes farming of course um, we talk that's a fundamental thing right river banks huh? minerals, <coughs> minerals? 
soil creation, the first thing I said, mm. that is the mm. biggest mm. economic value which has been completely left, left out of economics. Mineral mixing. Mineral mixing, soil creation, deposition, erosion. Yeah, nobody talks about soil in economics. Nobody looks at rivers as a source of soil deposition there. Anything else that we can think of? Recreation. recreation, yeah, tourism, recreation, uh, it's a source of spiritual uh, mm. place, you know, the, it's a place where you can you know, go back to your senses, all of those, yeah. Let's look at non-economic values. Hmm. What are the non-economic values of rivers? Biodiversity. Biological diversity, why is that a non-economic value? Because no one buys... Uh, no one cares about it. No one cares about it. <laughs> Why doesn't anybody care about soil diversity? Because it does not have a market price to it. It's mm. Yeah. If you have a market price, then it is coveted. If there is no market price, nobody cares for it. You know, air does not have a market price. We don't care for it. Everybody buys two, three cars and spews out the, the smoke in the on the river on, on the roads. But we cannot it. also buy air. Thankfully. <laughs> but we have to start buying also. Oxygen to mil nahi padega. We have oxygen bar. Yes. PMC is putting up some oxygen park. Yeah, yeah. Yes. By cutting 59 trees. What a brilliant. After idea. after cutting 59 trees, yeah. they are building the oxygen bar. Yeah. Very nice. That is it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then we'll get sharpness so much of oxygen. Yeah. So biological diversity is something which comes from so mainland is all freshwater organisms. You don't have marine organisms after you leave the sea. So all the organisms need fresh water. Therefore, the biggest non-economic value, which is and when I say non-economic, it's not captured in economics. Mm. It is of economic value actually, but we don't realize that is uh, irrigation of forests creation of uh, biological diversity and uh, the trees, the most important thing on the planet are the trees. I, I always like to use this example. We don't make our own food, right? Mm -hmm. Do we? We cook it, not make yeah. it. Do we make our own food? No, we don't. We watch Sanjeev Kapoor do something and we make a recipe out of it, but we don't make our own food. Do tigers make their own food? No. Mm -hmm. no. no. Do butterflies? No. Birds? No. Animals? No. Who makes their own food? Trees make for us. The only organisms on the planet who make their own food are the organisms who have the photosynthetic capacity. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they are extremely unique. The entire planet rests upon the shoulders of those who can produce their own food. That is the <coughs> plant organism. Yeah? And then the chain starts. But they know that they have to create food for the entire planet. Therefore, they create so much surplus of their own food. They don't need so many leaves. They don't need so many fruits. They don't need so much nectar. They don't need so much flowers. They don't need their work to be so big. But they know that the entire food chain rests upon what they are producing. And therefore, they are the ones on whose shoulders you and I exist and all the biological diversity. And they are irrigated by surface water and groundwater. That is the single most important non-economic value, which should actually be economic value. Now, none of them can survive on marine water. They have to have the hydrologic cycle. Mm -hmm. So that becomes the single most thing which we completely overlook in our economic thinking and our economic textbook. But now, sir, they are culturing the uh, food in uh, laboratories also. Now they have the started testing, making meat yeah. in laboratories. They have what do the scientists who make that meat, what do they eat? They are first yeah, eating the raw, uh, of they course, for right, them, they right now they are. Yeah. But they, they have started yeah. shifting, means even if yeah. The work is uh, started. So you'll be surprised. Okay, let's go back to what she's saying. Huh? Can we make our own food? Without 
Yeah. So the answer to the question of can we make our own food is very simple. Nature has tells us that no, you cannot make your own food. In the laboratory, you can. So manufacturing and production is a figment of the economist's imagination. There is no manufacturing and production. You can only convert from one thing to another. Conversion is possible, but not manufacturing. You can matter cannot be created not destroyed. However much whoever thinks he can create matter or he can create wealth, it cannot be done. You can transform something into matter. Right? So the entire story about the planet is about transformation. The sunlight, the amount of solar energy falling on the planet is converted into photosynthetic capacity, converted into leaves, food, and then it is converted into biomass like you know, the skin and my flesh and my muscles. All of that is all biological mass which is created by photosynthetic capacity. So there is nothing possible which can be created there. So what what is what is the other non-economic value? Temperature regulation. Come again? Temperature regulation. Food. Temperature, temperature regulation. regulation. Yeah, indeed. Microclimate, temperature regulation, atmospheric gas balance, groundwater recharge, all of these are what are called as ecological services which the river provides. Huh? Carbon fixation. Carbon fixation. Carbon sequestration. It allows Phytoplankton and phytoplankton actually sequester carbon. Wetlands are one of the biggest carbon sinks on the planet. After oceans, mangrove, all of these are carbon sinks. Sindarbans is a huge carbon sink. All of that is all what we term as non-economic value in that. So the river is very unique because it flows on a terrestrial ecosystem. It's an aquatic ecosystem which is flowing. And this terrestrial and aquatic ecosystem that interface is what we call as the riparian zone. And the riparian zones are extremely important for the exchange of matter and energy. What is an ecosystem? Monali, I think, has already done this little thing of what ecosystems and biodiversity, right? Just revising what she said. Ecosystems have two factors. One, physical factors, and you have biological factors. And the exchange of matter and energy between the physical and biological element makes up an ecosystem. What do you mean by exchange of matter and energy? Matter and energy. Food production is exchange of matter and energy. The, the plant takes minerals from the soil, which is physical matter. It takes water, which is physical, and it creates biological mass. Exchange of matter and energy. The hydrologic cycle is an exchange of matter and energy. The sun heats up the water, it converts into evaporation, it forms clouds and it exchanges it in some other place. It, it's an exchange of matter and energy. Uh, groundwater recharge is exchange of matter and energy. Anything which says, a tree which is sitting on, on the river bank, the leaves fall into the water, exchange of matter. Those leaves are eaten by the degraders, exchange of energy. Those, those fish are eaten by some other predator, exchange of energy. They are caught by humans and eaten, exchange of energy. So there is a continuous exchange of matter and energy which is going on in all the rivers all the time. And that gives rise to what we call as ecological services. So ecological services of the river are not at all captured in any economic way. No economist knows about it. It's very strange, but then. It's like the Ignoring the very fundamental and the base foundation. Of foundation. The, the very foundation we are ignoring. Ignoring the reason why we, how we exist, why rather than how we, how we exist. exist. Yeah. Uh, for us, exist. economy is different. Yeah. It's uh, just gaining and greediness, yeah, I think we isn't are it? Our existence. Yeah. And then we we are know economy, like but uh, to our greed. It's just we assume that it's there. Yeah. Hmm. That's hmm. there. Hmm. That's hmm. the assumption. Right. But it's not considered by planning. But then it is guaranteed but now to that develop. assumption is getting... <laughs> we can see it. ...is going to be yeah. questioned then. When I was drinking water, I was looking at matter which needs to be exchanged. I can see mangoes there. Mm, <laughs> yes. <laughs> we are in mango yeah, orchid. There are so many fruit packs here. You can actually smell the fig. So when I stand here, yes. the fermentation yeah. mm, mm. Umbar. Umbar. Yeah. Umbar. Yeah. Umbar. Audumbar. So that's the critical riparian uh, vegetation. Umbar, Waduns, Karan, which you see here, Pargambur, Sita. So all of these are typical um, interface 
zone kind of trees. You do find them in other places, but mainly here. Mm -hmm. There are many of them. There are many fauna which are endemic to northern Western Ghat. There are many which are endemic to southern Western Ghat. So in India, we have a lot of endemism. You go to Germany, they won't even know this word. <laughs> there is no endemism. It's such a small country. Really? It's not spread vertically. It doesn't have that diversity. You know, so that Though they have got all uh, mountainous area, they don't know what They is... don't have. The, they are in the, the temperate climate where they, they are... Uh, short in supply of sunlight, we, we are very rich in supply of sunlight and mm. therefore the floral diversity doesn't exist. So the physical diversity doesn't exist, therefore the floral diversity is minimum and because the floral diversity is minimum, the faunal diversity is very high. So all these are interconnected. India is tropical Most part. Okay. Economics of the RFD. RFD. Oh, yes. Ah, garam hai. 